Greetings dear viewers, today's video is about a German new space company that wants to challenge SpaceX with their price per kilogram for small sats. They are called Rocket Factory Augsburg or RFA for short and unsurprisingly come from Augsburg, an old smaller city near Munich. Their current focus is to get their RFA-1 launcher off the ground, but they also have bigger goals, like being space debris negative. Yes, not neutral, but negative. In this video we will explore where they come from and what they want to achieve. What have they done so far to reach those goals and how they are funding the initiative? How likely are they to succeed? And finally, why it is very important for Europe that they succeed. Stick to the end to learn all about them and let's go! Since Rocket Factory Augsburg is not yet, let's call it an established company of its own, let's start by looking at its origins. Obviously, if they come from a space background, they are more trustworthy than a random person deciding to venture into a difficult industry, not talking about anyone in particular. In this area the RFA is coming off strong. Today they seem like a separate newcomer, but their beginnings were not like that at all. The company was originally created as a fully owned subsidiary of OHB, one of the largest European space corporations, which works on all kinds of space activities. They build satellites, they build telescopes, and they have even built lab equipment for the European Columbus module of the ISS. Most importantly, OHB is stable and you could say established, bringing in profit rather than running of outside investment. In late 2019, Rocket Factory Augsburg was separated from OHB and turned into a public limited company. It started trying to obtain funding of its own, however OHB still remains the main investor and contract provider. They may look like a random startup from the outside, but they have a strong industry background. It is not hard to guess what their goal is. Well, their name has Rocket Factory in it, so naturally they want to build rockets on a big scale. This starts with the RFA-1 rocket, currently scheduled to launch for the first time at the end of this year, 2022, assuming no delays, which almost always happens, so don't get attached to the date. Anyway, the wait will be worth it, because at least on paper, this rocket will be revolutionary for the small sat market. The cost per kilogram of payload they are aiming for rivals that of SpaceX at $3,000, with a total launch cost of around 3 million euros. This is for 1,600 kilograms to the low Earth orbit and 450 for the geostationary orbit. Those are astonishing numbers, assuming they can actually be met. As a comparison, the most established small sat launcher right now, Rocket Lab, has cost per launch of their Electron rocket of about 7.5 million dollars, which carries up to 300 kilograms to the low Earth orbit. Other competitors mostly plan on launching smaller payloads. Virgin Orbit carries up to 500 kilograms on the Launcher 1, and the German competitor Isar Aerospace wants to deliver a thousand kilograms with their Spectrum rocket. The rocket factory plans on starting big and one has to ask the question how. How are they planning to achieve such a low price point for this big of a payload? This question how to develop the rocket is one every such company needs to ask themselves and there are many possible approaches. There are ones like SpaceX, which follows the idea of vertical integration and developing many technologies in-house. There are also others like Boeing, which often contract out work to external parties for the parts they need. Rocket Factory Augsburg kind of took a third approach that we have yet to see if it is practical. They use a lot of industrial quality commercially available components, mostly coming from the automotive industry which they only slightly modify or certify for the conditions of space. That way, in theory, they can have the best of both worlds. They get parts enabling a standardized and modular production process, and they don't have to spend a lot of money on developing new solutions. The questions and skepticism I have about this approach are how well those parts are going to work in this unusual environment, 
and how replaceable will they be? If one part becomes unavailable, how big of an impact will it have on the whole production process? Perhaps it will turn out that this is the way to go, and if they can pull it off, this approach to production will certainly create a significant advantage for the company. The low costs of vehicle development won't push their launch prices up, as they will for many competitors. Of course, there are some vital parts that can't be just bought off the shelf, which have to be developed in-house. This includes the most important part of the rocket, its engines. Those are the parts that require the most complex engineering, and the engine produced by the rocket factory Augsburg looks very promising. It was named the Helix engine this year as a result of a popular vote and has already undergone some testing I will talk about later. The Helix is a closed cycle staged combustion engine, which is not really seen among competitors and provides very good efficiency. This bet on a more complicated engine structure is balanced by the more traditional fuel used kerosene instead of methane, making it more reachable for a startup. For the cutting edge, the company also uses additive manufacturing for many parts of the engine, which looks cool. On the rocket itself you will find 10 of those, 9 for the first stage and 1 for the second stage. There will also be a third stage with a different propulsion solution. And perhaps this third stage, or the orbital transfer vehicle, OTV for short, will be the biggest advantage of the design. It actually fires before the payload reaches the orbital velocity, which is quite unusual. The company claims that through many simulations they found out that this is the most optimal way for them in terms of the payload they can put into orbit. It can also carry much more fuel than required for the mission and is expected to be able to stay in space on average for up to 5 years without failure. This allows for a range of possibilities, for example if your mission plan includes a lot of orbital changes and adjustments that would be the vehicle to choose. It is also vital for the ambition of the RFA to be space debris negative. After delivering the payload, the OTV can scout the orbit similar to the ones it is at for space debris, intercept it and bring it back down to burn in the atmosphere with it. This is a practice that every company should follow, it is scary how little care is put into managing how much trash we put in orbit, simply a disaster waiting to happen. It is really exciting to see that not everyone turns a blind eye to the issue so important for our future in space. But of course, to be able to make use of this great OTV design, the rocket must fly first, so let's take a look at what the company has accomplished so far. Many tank prototypes of the RFA-1 rocket have already been built and tested. In 2021, the company also completed a successful pressure test to failure of its tanks, and like most tests of this kind, it looked spectacular. There is just something exciting about watching things burst. Engine-wise, the company has gone through manifold tests, with the latest one at the time of recording being a test campaign during which the same Helix engine was fired up for a total of 74 seconds, distributed among three firings of 4, 30 and 40 seconds. This success is great news, right? Now there are no other companies in the European Union to have a staged combustion engine, making the RFA the first. Now they will focus on the integrated system tests, after which the way towards the first launch attempt becomes much shorter. The rocket also has to launch from somewhere, and RFA has already secured three launch sites. The first one in Norway will cater mostly to the European market. Right now, small sat makers in Europe have to take on long, costly and risky journeys with their payloads to the launch site, but soon this will not be the case with spaceports in the UK and Norway becoming fully operational. The second launch site will be the European spaceport, although the location in Norway may be convenient, you can't launch to every orbit from there, which is why it is excellent to see RFA planning to launch from there too. The last spaceport we know of as of now is the Southern Launch, located in South Australia. It is to serve as a regional launch site for the Asia-Pacific region. It will be interesting to see how many launches will actually be conducted from this unusual location. 
The coverage of the launch sites is global, just like the ambitions of the company. The last thing required to launch a rocket would be paying customers signing contracts. Here, the RFA is in quite a comfortable situation, mostly due to its origins. The company RFA was originally a part of, OHB, is not just a random investor, they are a strategic investor. This means that they give money to the company not only as means of making a profit in the future, but also to have a cheap launch provider they can launch their own satellites with. This guarantees that RFA will have satellites to launch, which also brings in more confidence to other parties, allowing RFA to score contracts with them. The maiden flight of the RFA-1 was supposed to carry a payload from a Ukrainian startup called Lunar Research Service. Sadly, this will no longer be possible. The company volunteered their technology and manpower to help fight back the Russian aggression. You can read more about them in the article in the description. I wish them the best at that one day their technology reaches the moon. So far there was no news about any other customer for the first flight, so we have no way of knowing what the plans are. Moving on to the funding of this project, it is quite hard to estimate what is the budget of the company. I could not find any reliable source with such information. A lot of it is not public knowledge, especially since the company started as part of the OHB. What is known is that in the last round of funding they have raised something north of 25 million euros, and recently they have also been awarded 11 million euros from the German Aerospace Center DLR from their micro launcher competition. This also makes DLR another customer of the RFA, perhaps even the first one to fly. I think it is okay to assume that the company is on track with their financial goals, since they continue to hire new staff. Their current employee count is over 160 from 32 different countries. This is an advantage the RFA and other European space startups have over the American ones. Rocket technologies are protected in the US, making it impossible to gather international talent. The European companies have access to a much larger pool of people, which in other industries always proves to be important. But those employees also need to be managed by talented people in order for the company to succeed. So let's quickly go over the most important people in the company. I apologize in advance for any mispronunciations. The chief commercial officer of the company is Mr. Jörn Spürmann, who previously worked as a project manager for the DLR and the head of sales of MD Aerospace, definitely an experienced expert in his field. The chief operating officer is Dr. Stefan Brischenk, who has been an aerospace research scientist and worked as a vehicle testing manager at none other than Rocket Lab, giving him business-specific insight. The company also has really good advisors, the CEO of MT Aerospace, a big company related to OHB, the CEO of OHB, and Mr. Jean-Jacques Dordain, who used to be the Director General of the European Space Agency. The only person left is the CEO of the Rocket Factory, and I deliberately discuss him last. He stands out among this team, like in those games where you need to mark an object that does not fit. Although he has a lot of managerial experience in big companies, including being a country director at Google, he does not have any aerospace experience, which is usually a red flag. I hope that this will not hinder the company and that he can lead the RFA to a success with his other skills. And their success is really needed for Europe. As of today, the only European launch provider is Ariens Pass, and although they have plans to innovate and come back to their former glory, for now they are stuck in the past with expensive, not reusable rockets. Space is at the forefront of new technologies, and if Europe does not want to get behind, it needs more companies like Rocket Factory Augsburg to innovate and provide space capabilities. Right now it is much harder to find investors in the space industry in Europe than it is in the USA or China, and this needs to change. Hopefully the success of one company can give a wake-up call to European investors and provide the local market with much needed capital. I'm not saying that RFA needs to be the one, 
There are also other European startups like Isar Aerospace, Orbex, Skyrora and others which have the potential to successfully enter the market, but right now my eyes are on the RFA, as they seem to be developing the most capable vehicle. The rocket factory Augsburg is a really promising new space company, and if it succeeds it will definitely take a significant part of the small sat market away from rideshare companies such as SpaceX. I wish them the best and can't wait to watch their first orbital attempt. If you are interested in European spaceflight, make sure to check out my video on the ins and outs of the European Space Agency. If you enjoyed this summary of the RFA, like and subscribe, there will be more coming. It's been Rivus Space here, stay excited about the future and have a great day!